Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand this time to our speaker, Dr. William Tan. Just pray for him before uh, I hand the mic over to him for you to speak. Father, we thank you for our elder, Dr. William Tan, who is the speaker this morning. Father, we thank you for the many occasions he has spoken before and for some of the messages that really are convicting and has spoken to us and done some uh, important work in our lives that we may not realize today, but we will realize in time to come. Father, we have to ask that you continue to use him, anoint him, and let the message come through powerfully to minister to us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. And this morning, I'm going to talk about the attributes of God. I'm sure when and I tell you about the attributes of God, a lot of you are uh, not going to that boring subject again. Because the attributes of God are the characters of God, are the characteristics of the personality of God. So a lot of people think that, oh, maybe I've heard of this before. And you think that to preach it again and again can be very boring. But you never know, no? a sermon preached repeatedly, somehow, somehow some gems of truth you should never know before came up and bring life to your soul. Don't you think so? The things that you go, oh, I've heard this before, but when something speech again and again, after a while you found something which I missed you know, some time ago when this sermon was speech. Now it's brought a light you know, to my mind and to my heart. Now, how we view life, how we think life should be, its purpose, its meaning, will determine very much how we live our lives. Don't you think so? For example, if you think there's no life after death, then you live at least there's no uh, uh, there's no tomorrow. You live, you do what you want, and you don't care what others say about you. You can do what you like because after all, there's no life after death. You no. Know? So all of us, you are what you think life should be, and you are what you believe life should be. And for example, if you are one of those who believe in reincarnation, you try to be a good person, try to try to do your best as you can, so that now that you, you are a human being, next time you can be a, 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 a tortoise, but you want to be a monkey, a monkey wants to be doing some, something else. You want to be as good as you can, because with the reincarnated next life, you'll be better than what you were before. Isn't it? You are what you believe life is all about. Similarly, as Christians, you know, we must have a right view of God. If a wrong view of God, we will live poorly and we will dishonor God, if we even blaspheme God. So a right view of God is very, very important. If a wrong view of God, you live poorly. And not, as I say, not only that, you blaspheme God. For example, if you think God is an angry tyrant you know, going around the world with his cane, you know, hoping to find him, find fault with you and, and judging you for who you are, his wrath will be upon you because of what you have done wrong, then you think God is an angry tyrant, then you will not, you try to avoid him, isn't it? But if you think God is a sinner grandfather sitting out in the clouds there waiting for, not worrying about what's happening in the world, then you live purposeless life. We live lives of no purpose. We do not live lives as, as it should be. You think that God is a hard taskmaster, you know, squeezing every ounce, every ounce of energy, every ounce of service from you, or, or, uh, trying to tell you you must do this, you must, you must do that. Then you be, you live life angrily, you live life poorly. Then you, you, then you tell yourself that you have no meaning at all. Life has no meaning for you. You are just a, a sort of a number in his family that God do not care for you personally. What I'm trying to say is that a right knowledge of God is very, very important. You make us live right, you will honor God in every day. You know it's a wicked thing to tell others about God uh, other than who He is, whether it's more or less, it's a wicked thing you know, to tell others 
uh, what God is not in love. Now, you tell me, William, how do you know what God is like? Where do you get the information from? There is no need for you to speculate, no need for you to second guess, no need for you to read books, other books to tell what God is like. It's very much the word of God. God reveals himself of who he is like. And that is actually found in Exodus chapter 34, verse 1 to 9, which I want to read to you. God himself says that what? That's who he is. I'm not making it up, but it's all there. I want to read to you. You will think about it carefully. When the sermon is finished, go back and read again and again. And read different versions. You can see for yourself the nuances of all the words that you have written here. You know the whole personality of God. Shall we turn to Exodus chapter 34, verse 1 to 9, I read to you. And the Lord said to Moses, um, Exodus, Exodus 34, And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Very important. Like the first ones. Why? Because Moses, what he did, And I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. A covenant was broken the first time. And God has asked Moses, You Take another two tablets of stone. This time I'm going to make a new covenant with you. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourselves to be me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, Jehovah, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Some versions will say abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness, keeping loving kindness for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, wasting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children in the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. Then Moses said, If now I have found favour of grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquities and our sin, and take us as your in inheritance. It's important for you to see in the context of what's happening now. Moses had two stones initially, and that stone was broken. Why? Because two chapters before, chapter 32, when Moses was to Mount Sinai many days, 40 days or so up there, the people of Israel were thinking, where is this man now? The man who led us out of Egypt, he must be dead by, by now. Who is going to take us to the promised land? Let us make a golden calf and let this golden calf take us back to Egypt. And Aaron, Aaron because of pressure, because of pressure of the crowd asking to do it, Aaron has to take us all the Israelites to take all the gold ornaments, burn it, and make a golden calf. And Moses at that time when he was up there, he did not know, but God knew. God told Moses, you go down and see what your people is doing. After all the miracles are done for them, you know, making them cross on dry land, across the Red Sea, everything, all the manna and the water I supplied with them in the, this, this uh, terrible desert, Yet they do not believe in me. The, the two stones, you bring it down. And what did Moses do? Moses brought it down and broke the stones. But that's the end of it. And God told them, I'm going to wipe out this group of people and I'm going to have another group of people that will not so speak like as this group of people. But God was good. What did God say? You make two new stones. What did God trying to say? God sits right and say, I will renew a covenant with you. Okay. So it is important for us to realize that
But despite all this, you know, what did God say? What did God say for Himself? God is a compassionate, you see. Verse 34, God said, And the Lord passed before Moses. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious. The word merciful is translated compassionate. Long suffering and abounding in uh, loving kindness and faithfulness. Despite what the people, the Jews, had done to him, despite breaking the first covenant, what would the first thing God would do? You see, God, God, God angry, you know, but God didn't say that. God is a compassionate and gracious God, despite uh, uh, the unbelief uh, of the people. So, instead of saying that, I'm omniscient, I'm going to judge, I'm going to judge you for what you've done, uh, done. I'm going to get rid of you. That, that, that's what he said. But yet, he asked Moses to make two stones. His mercy and compassion never ends. Sometime, next one. So it's important for us, despite that, God never reveals himself initially as a judge. Huh? God never reveals himself as a person who's omnipotent. God never reveals himself as a person who's omniscient, who knows everything. Huh? God never uh, uh, reveals himself initially as an omnipresence, everywhere at the same time. But God reveals himself as what? As a compassionate and gracious God. I want to go through all these six qualities of God to tell you the nature of God. And I want you, when you finish, go back and read it again and again to see the God that we worship, the God that we serve. Not to be so worried that this is a God who will abandon you, but this is a God who is compassionate and gracious. Now, the first one is compassion. Compassion means mercy. The word is Raham, you know, in Hebrew. What is the middle word for whom? Rahim. I think the root word, the Arabic word, comes from this word. It's a connection between the mother and the child. Now, the, the word compassion means uh, it's a death love of the mother for a child. You know, I, we can never appreciate uh, our mother's love for us. Not to mention our father's love for us. Our father, especially in Chinese families, our fathers don't show love for us enough. Yet we know, we know they really love us. How? They envy you. They, they provide all the money that you need for you for to be educated. They work day and night, not, not for themselves, but for you. But the, the thing I want to uh, emphasize now is that that is the word compassion that God has for you, you and I. It's a connection, it's a death compassion of the mother for the child that he carries. And that is very much in God's heart when he said in Psalm 103, as a father have compassion or pity you, so the Lord have compassion on those who fear him. The compassion heart of Abraham. It's very important for us to realize that God has a compassion heart despite what the Israelites did to him. He got this compassion eh, for, for, for them. He knows, eh, even though they are still men, he had to be compassionate for them because they are like, you, know, you read in Psalms 0 3, they are like dust. God knows our real estate, God knows our, uh, our deficiencies, God knows who we are, and how we can be very stiff neck, stubborn, and but God has this compassion heart, which Huh? The most, the best example of this compassion heart is where? Is the story of the prodigal son. That's the best illustration of God's compassion for us. Every day the father looks towards the horizon, hoping to see a shadow of man coming back. Every day he goes up, sunrise, he go, probably sunrise cannot see much. Sunset, you will sit down there looking on the horizon, waiting for the shadow of a person coming back. And day with him. And one day he found the shadow of a man <coughs> coming back. So what did he do? He rushed towards this man, he knew that his son. He embraced him 
and do the service, bring the best cup, bring the sandals, bring the gold uh, uh, ring, give it to him and clothe him. For this son that was lost is now found. This son, they have lost so many years. We have been looking forward for, for him to come back. He has come back. And that is an illustration of the compassion of God. No matter what you do, you know the song, I like the song I do. <laughs> that you, nothing you can do will make him love you more. And nothing that you've done will make him close to God. That's a compassion of God. We cannot live huh, without compassion of God. Because all of us, huh, we live poor lives. I mean, all of us are people like me and all of you. All of us. So what I'm trying to say, despite all the lives that you have left, you have lived poorly, you know, despite all the mistakes, all the sins, anything, you know, God has a compassion in us. Always looking for you to come back. And you come back, huh, or you have your mouth, and even the elder brother got jealous, isn't it? It shows, despite what the elder brother says for the younger brother, God has this compassion for you, right? that pities you, like a mother has compassion on his, on, his, on his own child. And next one, gracious, Karan, Charan. I got a patient whose name is Charan Khan. Charan Ali in Hindi, I think there is some, uh, maybe, uh, children is not here. Uh, Charan means uh, actually, uh, is gracious. I don't know how the Punjabis uh, pronounce it. I, I think they use Karan then. I don't know how they pronounce it. Huh? But the word in Greek is Charis. To be gracious. That we all know the definition of grace. Huh? What's the definition of grace? non meritorious unearned, unmerited favor or blessing. Isn't it? We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We cannot, uh, if we don't have anything to demand that we, have, we should have it, but yet God gave it to us. That is what it means. The Lord of the universe bend down, incline, stoop towards your level and grace you. God got every right not to grace you because He's a spirit being. He's our creator. We are created. But the word gracious actually means uh, God Himself bend down, incline Himself. Stoop at your level. That's what it means. Amazing grace. Uh, how can it be that thou, God, can die for me? Amazing grace. The song, beautiful song by John Newton, what do you say? Amazing grace, how that saved a wretch like me. Why was he a wretch? Because he was a slave driver, slave trader. That's why. How can God save him? He says, amazing, because that's what God is. He is gracious. He is Sharon. He is Shavis. He bends, he stoops, he inclines towards you. That's what it is. God is a gracious God, a merciful God. And thirdly, slow to anger, long suffering, long temper. A person with a long fuse. When we say a person with short fuse means the person is very hot and tempered. Any small thing get irritated, get very angry. You know a lot, a lot of murders and crimes are, are crimes of passion. All the road rage. They are crimes of passion. Then then you get angry. If only a gentle word huh, can solve it out. I many times I get angry and ask them keep it. And drive the car, and drive so slowly, like, oh, I'll take you know, for no you know, reason, uh, park there in the middle of the road, when nobody can move from, when the honey got angry, when you up you, something. But these are the things, huh? you, you can, I remember one day, you know, I, I was in Australia, I remember my uh, landlord, he took me down the car, his old car, you know, he took me down, we were just turning in, turning left, all of a sudden the car from the back, huh, swerve in and cut in. My daughter was very angry, my daughter was chasing, you know, speed up and try to catch up with him and, and force him off the road. They nearly had a fight. But just one gentle word, no need to say much, sorry. Then all of a sudden the first face, you know. I don't know what happened, but my, my, my daughter is a person with very soft, soft voice, you know. 
But just one gentle word, I'm sorry. Oh, everything gone. But many would reach me. One false word, one action word. And we just, I just saw a few uh, YouTube some. Huh? Oh, some of them got killed, you know, for, for simple, for simple, uh, small accidents. It's something I need to learn by myself. It's something I need to learn or something. But uh, God, is it God? What? He do not have a short fuse, long fuse. Huh? Huh? So immense patience. Huh? And will not be quick to retaliate or punish. If you quick to retaliate on you, then yes, he did tell Moses, I'm going to buy them off. But Moses said, yeah, you, you brought them up, you know. How can you buy them off? You can, he said, I'm going to have another new group of people. No, you wipe them out. They have seen your miracles. Now it's time for you to finish the work. God, God will do that. God has a very long fuse, not a short one. That's what I say. And a lot of people say, oh, the Lord is why, uh, supposed to come, you know, supposed to judge his, these evil people, you know, these evil people all over the world. Huh? God, why God is going to judge them? He's a judge, isn't it? <laughs> Two Peter is between. The Lord did not slept concerning his promise at some point, but it's long suffering, it's patient, long temper towards us. Not willing anyone should perish, but all should come to repentance. No, as a parent, if your child is delivered, how long do you need to wait for your son or daughter to change? But as a parent, we have a lot of patience. In fact, sometimes we even encourage our son and daughter, the real son and daughter, to do what they want. Hopefully, they will come back to their senses and turn back. No, I mean, you know, parents are, who supply their drug addict uh, child uh, with money to buy drugs, you know, hopefully to gain their uh, favor so that they will come back. A parent will go to that extent to make sure that the child will come back. And similarly, God will go to that extent. Uh, that extent of showing, showing favor after favor, patient, patiently waiting for the person to change. That's what God is. So it's important for us to realize that's what of God we are dealing with now. Compassionate, gracious, long suffering. Okay. Very, very important for us to realize it. You see, the golden calf, you know, every reason for God to judge them. God did say, you know, I will write them out. And to be fair, there was a plague after that. Some of those who are involved, uh, really involved, uh, were, were, were wiped out. But uh, God didn't wipe out the whole tribe, the whole nation of Israel. Uh, there are innocent people there. You know. Even God was very angry with uh, Aaron. Moses said, Aaron, why, why do you do this sort of thing? He said, I was, a, I, I was afraid. Because uh, they, they are coming after me. And we are waiting for you to come down from Mount Sinai. You were there. We thought you are, you are, you are long gone. But then, then, then even God remembers what Aaron did. God remembers those who did it. Sure, he judged them. But because of his slowness of anger, because of the long temper, a person long feels, he is willing to bear with them, to bring them to the promised land. Uh, fourthly, uh, this is a very good word, this is important. The word here is, sometimes you read here, you read for yourself here, the word they, they say is abounding in goodness and truth. Now, it's, now goodness and truth, actually the actual word is abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness. Uh, uh, you look at, go back and read, actually the word is abounding in, lo abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness. The word loving kindness is steadfast love. It's a word neset. H E S E D, actually, I look back, it's pronounced with a K, K in front. Neset. Neset actually is a parliament in Israel, isn't it? You call it Neset. K N E S S E T. This one, has it in Hebrew, is pronounced as actually with a, with a K one. Pronounced. Some people use C, they, they spell C H E S E D. But it's pronounced as a K, ne, ne, ze, ne, knife, neze. 
in Hebrew. It's one of the most important words in the Bible. You know Psalm 136? Give thanks to the Lord for His good, for His. Give thanks to the Lord of the God of God. Uh, give thanks to the Lord of God for His steadfast love and His word. That's the word. Give thanks to the God, to the Lord for His good, for His asset and His word. His loving kindness and His word. You read there are 20 verses there, one, Psalm 136. That's the word that's been used for his uh, loving kindness and doers for the Lord. Now, what's the difference between this and mercy? The first one we have is uh, compassion. Compassion is for mother to child. This one, this has a, is a covenantal love. The covenant that um, uh, 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 God has with Israel, God himself will put his name there. Uh, he said, that is my covenant love. On my part, I will do what I said. You can do, you, you should do what you are supposed to do. Even though you don't do, I on my part will do. Because it's a covenant. It's an agreement. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a prophet. Just me. Will correct me. It's an agreement. And on his part, on God's part, because of his honor, huh? Because of who he is, he never changed. He will always keep his part of the bargain. Keep his part of the agreement. I know that a lot of people don't keep the part of the agreement. If you now want to change the first agreement, I know. But on God's part, no. You know, the book of Hosea is a very important book about love, you know. The love of God for the church, the love of God for his uh, people. Now, Hosea said, you know, Despite uh, the stiff neck people, it's very interesting. I think I think Pastor Ong did preach it very uh, eloquently uh, some time ago. Always. This Hosea, the prophet, was asked uh, to marry a prostitute. No. Why? Because God is trying to tell them that, that you have gone, you have gone out of me, you have gone out of my uh, covenant. I've covenanted you with love. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in uprightness, in justice, and in hazard and tenderness. I betroth you. I brought you up. I brought you as a family. I'm your God. You are my people. And yet, you renegated on your agreement. You reneged on your agreement. But I myself, God said, I will still betroth you. At this, after they left him, remember? That's why he told Hosea, you will marry her again, even though she will prostitute her, herself. You marry her again because I will betroth you again. That is actually what it is. A loving kindness, a steadfast love of God towards his people. I, I know it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult for us to understand, but that's what the God we, we, uh, we have him. Not a God who just won't judge you. But there are a few more things I want to say before I finish now, but that's important. The loving kindness of God, you go back and read it, huh? the headset of God, huh? very, very important. Okay, the next one. The next one huh, is in Isaiah, so you read for some 54 verse 10, he reads. Though the mountains be shaken, huh? the hills be removed, my unfailing love has said, my covenantal love would not be shaken. Don't you think it's a very it's a relief for us? The love that God has told you, that He has given to you, He will fulfill until the very end. The security that we have as Christians is guaranteed by the covenant. Jesus said, this is the covenant in my blood. Take this and remember me. That's what, that's what it means. The covenant for those who have taken of his blood and of his, of who, who recognize what it means, for those who know the broken body that was broken for your sin, the blood that was shed for our sin on the cross. That's what it means. 
It means that God remembers the covenant of old, remembers the covenant that Jesus has for us. So there's no need for us to fear because God will always keep his part of bargain in the covenant. You might not keep your part of bargain, but God will always keep his part of bargain. And that's very important. Ah, the next one is actually faithfulness. Faithfulness is tied very much huh, in, uh, in this uh, uh, long, uh, in this uh, loving kindness. Because, because God is faithful to his covenant. That's why you know, his long suffering will always be there. And long suffering, as I say, is a love in action. Action how now? Jesus died for us. God is not all talk, you know. God is actually action. It's easy for God to say, Oh, I love you. Huh? I got a headset for you. Show it to us. He showed it to the Israelites by bringing them, despite what they've done to bring, bring them to the them. He showed it to us when he sent his son Jesus to die for us. So that we too can free access to the throne of God. Ah, showing, you read for yourself, huh? it's very important. Huh? You say, what is that? Keeping loving kindness, the same way as the word kind, keeping loving kindness for thousands. The word thousands means, uh, actually, you read in some versions, uh, it means thousands of generations, you know. One generation, how many years? 60 years, 70 years? Thousand generations. Actually, what my God is trying to say, His mercy for us uh, is forever one. You cannot count one. That's what it means. Uh, some versions say for thousand generations, not to thousands of people, uh, to a thousands of generations. That's what it means. Huh? Then, uh, is it? Uh, uh, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Forgiving everything. What's the difference between sin, transgressions, and iniquity? What's the difference? There's, there's some minor differences in it. But the important thing is, no matter what difference is, anything that's at front to, to the holiness of God, to the justice of God, uh, is a sin or iniquity or rebellion or transgression. But God forgives them all. All of them, He wipes them all, all, all out. Nothing is left un, 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 uncovered. Nothing is left uncovered. Everything has been completely wiped out. You might be thinking to yourself now, how can God forgive me this time? Yes, God has forgiven me sometime before. But I did something which God, I think, will not forgive me this time. Many times we feel that that in that way, in it, we feel condemned. God will not forgive me uh, this time. I said that I won't do it again. Huh? Yes, I do it again. Last time I thought uh, God really forgiven me, but this time I do it again. I don't think He will. But be rest assured. Forgiving iniquity, rebellion, sin to a thousand generations. That's what it is. You know, Psalm 32, verse 1, you go there and read the uh, joy of being forgiven. Uh, blessed is the man whose transgression was forgiven. Uh, the greatest test to see whether where we are, God has forgiven us. What's the greatest test? To to tell us, to know that we have been forgiven by God, the greatest test is to forgive others. How do you know uh, that God has forgiven you? Yes, it's, it's in the word, we know. But the greatest test we see is whether we have forgiven others or not. Uh, the greatest test of your love for God is whether you love others or not. And the greatest test of forgiveness, huh? to know the forgiveness of God in your life, is actually to forgive others. It's found actually to read for yourself Ephesians chapter 4, 31, 3, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Okay, read for yourself. Okay. Now, okay, lastly, very important, uh, okay, he said, what did he say? Yet, yet, why you did? The caveat is that, the caveat, C-A-V-E-A-T. Caveat, I think the lawyers will tell you, it's a warning. It's something for us to be aware of. Yet, he does not ignore sin. 
He does not forget the things you have done to him. He does not excuse. He does not clear. What I'm trying to say here, there's a key here. God is compassionate, God is merciful, long suffering, uh, uh, loving, uh, it is God in loving kindness, He is uh, faithful, uh, He forgives, yet He will never forget. Uh, okay, now, uh, God, why? God cannot just pass over sin. It's an affront to His holiness and injustice, a rebuke Lord, to His character. It must be exposed for what it is, and most importantly, for us, we thank this people, it's a tone already for us. He made him, Jesus, God made him, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Um, 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. Thanks be to God. Even though he does not ignore sin, he does not clear sin, he does not excuse our sin, uh, he because of his justice, must deal with sin, and thanks be to God, he did it. He dealt it completely at the cross. So all rebellion, all iniquity, all transgression, and all sin have been completely wiped out. That's the God that we have, who completely wipes out everything you owe to him. This morning, Pastor Hong just said, it's a debt we cannot pay. But it's a debt that we paid fully for you and I because of what Jesus had done at the cross in Calvary. That's what it is. Huh? We are free to serve Him without any guilt. There is now no condemnation to them when Christ uh, uh, Paul said. What is the greatest liberty worse that you have? No? no condemnation for them to those who are in Christ. How liberating it is to know huh, that despite who we are, what we are, Huh? Despite what we have done, because of that perfect sacrifice, because we acknowledge our, our uh, uh, we acknowledge who He is and we believe in Him, because of that sacrifice, uh, all the all the things that all the curses that God has given to will pronounce upon us has been completely wiped out. There's now now no condemn, condemnation. There's no need for all of us to fear. There's no need for us to worry. That, uh, that something else will happen to us, all the iniquities of our sin, even the future world have really been cancelled out by the cross where Jesus died. Of course, if you don't want to, you, you keep on persistently do that which is wrong, when you know it's wrong, then you have to suffer the consequences. For those who unintentionally live a life God will still remember His covenant. The, his covenant is forever. It, the covenant where Jesus has said, take this bread and take this wine for your, for, uh, 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 for your salvation. All these have been guaranteed to us at the cross. So there's no need for us to worry anymore. So it's important for us to rise, to re realize that it's a, this is the God that we have. I don't make it up. It's all in the word of God. And this is actually a very concise and comprehensive uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, verses in the Bible. Just two verses only, you know, telling you about the nature of God. And he did say to us, uh, resting of the iniquities of the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Does it mean that, uh, uh, that means the third and fourth generation will suffer for the sins of the fathers or grandfathers? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that, uh, it means that uh, each generation subsequent to the generation that that uh, that uh, that sinned against God, uh, each generation had to take into account what they need to do, what the fathers had made uh, mistakes in, and correct them. And in so doing, the curses will not go down. If the, we don't suffer for what our parents did, uh, neither did my father suffer for what, what their own father did. It's, it's not right in Ezekiel you read for him. Each man will suffer for his own sin. But if we must break that thing that our fathers or their fathers have done, uh, so that the curses will not fall onto the uh, next generation. That's, that's what the way means. Uh. How can we suffer for something which we didn't do? Uh, our, our fathers have done it, they have to suffer with it. But if we don't take care, 
and do the same thing as what the fathers have done, then we have to suffer for it. But our grandchildren and grandchildren, they have to make sure that they don't do the things that we have done wrong, so that they will not suffer you know, the consequences of, or, or, or the curses that were passed. That's what it means. Uh. But third and fourth generation mean. But the mercy of God now to a thousand generations. Oh, the love and the mercy and the gracious of God, uh, you can never comprehend. That's why uh, when Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, uh, Romans chapter 8 is, is the uh, chapter uh, in Romans uh, or in all the Bible, that chapter 8 you read for yourself, uh, it really tells you about the love of God. Can height or death or what separate you from the love of God? No. Can angels, principalities or what separate you from the love of God? No. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. And I leave with you this verse, huh? Romans chapter 8, this this verse, to know that God cares and loves, that compassion for you, gracious to you, patient with you, long-suffering, faithful to you, forgiving you, and this one, and does not condemn you. And this is the verse I want to read to you as I finish. Romans chapter 8, and this is something that you always read in a fantastic uh, chapter. It's the chapter in Romans. I think it's the chapter in the New Testament. You see here. Okay. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other great thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Such a fantastic verse. Why? It is because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. I always go back to that. If I know, I always go back to that. And I always appeal to God, look at what your son has done. And God will look at me in the eye and say, Yes, 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 yes. Always look at that. Very, very important. Uh, we Christians, uh, uh, we must always realize that the cross is fundamental to our faith. It's fundamental to you. The sinners one time for the whole world. It's very important for us. No matter what we have gone through, go back to the cross. Uh, and then you, you, you know once and for all. How much God has loved you? How much God cares for you? How much God wants you huh, to finish that race and, and to, to be a blessing to all? May the Lord bless you. Huh? Father, we thank you for your word. Your word always brings life. And you always bring life as your word is being preached. We thank you for your compassion, a gracious God. Long suffering, abounding for in loving kindness and faithfulness, showing mercies to a thousand generations. Uh, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, sin, and yet not forgetting those who sin against you. Father, we thank you, Father. We thank you all the curses that have been passed by the previous generation have been completely wiped out by the cross and carry. May we uh, continue to walk uh, uh, in the life of this, this uh, realization that our sins have been completely wiped out we can come boldly to a true place to praise and bless you and to be a blessing everywhere you go. To spread the greatness of Christ in your soul. That your name, the name of Jesus, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit may be lifted up all the world. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Please be asking thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.